Okay, so we were discussing how to characterize or how to measure vacancy concentration and in the last uh, lecture we saw the method of expansion. Today we will discuss the method for heat capacity. So we can also use heat capacity to measure vacancy concentration. So, how do we do that? Now, we know that x which is the equilibrium concentration of vacancies which can also be written as n equilibrium by uppercase n equal to E x p and then we have this entropy formation term and the entropy as and the exponential form uh, delta enthalpy term. So, now extra molar enthalpy can because of this uh, presence of vacancies can be written as due to so due to vacancies this can be written as this is the extra molar enthalpy which is now if this uh, number is n e q for the vacancy then it is n e q times delta h f 1 v this is the extra molar enthalpy. <coughs> now, we can also, uh, so we have the relation for n equilibrium, we can write it as n which is uh, per molar if we take then it is Avogadro number, this is delta h f 1 v and then the rest of the exponential terms as it occurred in the previous equation. Right now, delta Cp is as we know the definition is nothing but the derivative of this enthalpy with respect to temperature at constant pressure. So, this equation becomes let us hope that this we can fit this in this uh, line, it will become something like this. So, you see that this increase in this uh, C p heat capacity can be related to this relation and therefore, we can use this relation to find the concentration of the vacancies if we know delta C p which is the change in the enthalpy. So, this is uh, one method. Now, let us look at still another method which is uh, used which is kind of you can say exotic method which is called positron. annihilation spectroscopy. So, the first question here is what is positron? What is positron? Positron is nothing but antimatter of electrons. What does uh, antimatter imply? Antimatter implies that if you have electron and this antimatter which is positron, then they together they will annihilate each other and uh, since they have some mass, it will result in energy. So, you will get some uh, uh, you will get some energy in the form of light wave. So, it will uh, the equation can be usually written in this form E plus which is your positron, this is E minus which is your electron. When they combine together, you will get something like this gamma 1 plus gamma 2 which are the wavelengths of uh, two different gamma radiations and usually it comes out in this form that is why I have written otherwise you can also in a more general way you can just say gamma which will be the energy in terms of photons. And now here 
these are the gamma that can be detected. But what else? Why are we able to detect how this detection of the gamma after this positron annihilation is going to help us? Let us see. Let us say you have a mass with different concentration and over here you impinge it with positron. So, this has some concentration C 1, this has some concentration C 2. Now, the basic principle is that if the if there are defects somewhere inside it, so let us say C 2 is higher. Now, these defects act as a trap because they have lower electron densities and therefore, the electron the positron can spend more time meaning it will have less probability to uh, and get annihilated and therefore, the total time it takes for the pos this positron to get annihilated by electron is lower over here and higher uh, sorry the other way around because it has more a number of defects. So, it has lesser probability. So, it will take longer time to decay and here it will take shorter time to decay. So, that is the basic principle. So, by measuring this difference by measuring the time that it takes to decay one can find out what will be the concentration defect we will see in a little bit more detail. Okay, so, what are the things that are uh, needed for positron to get trapped or basically for the uh, even before that trapping for the positron to get annihilated what you need is electrons are needed and there are electrons then overlap of wave function must occur meaning the electrons which are can also be represented by a wave form a wave function and positron which can also be which can also be represented by a wave function they must overlap and once they overlap properly then you will have uh, they will get annihilated so overlap of this wave function must occur tau which is the time uh, tau is time for decay. So, that for example, here we have talked about the total time that it takes for a positron when you <laughs> inject it over here and the time that it gets annihilated. So, the lower number of uh, defects it means it will quickly pass on it will keep on moving and it will not decay easily over here it will get trapped in defects and therefore, it will have longer time to decay. So, that is the time we are calling that is the tau is the total time for decay and it is related to electron concentration and we know that vacancies are regions with low electron concentration. So, now this is the uh, relation between the defect which is the vacancy over here and the tau because now vacancies have lower concentration. So, positron will spend more time they will in a way get trapped positron will spend more time in these defects. And because of this the average decay time average decay time which is tau will increase. And you can model have a simple model to relate tau with concentration of vacancies. We will look at this uh, simple model that we have uh, that we that can be easily formulated. So, let us go to this simple model. So, we are talking about positron annihilation spectroscopy and a simple model. So, let us say that you inject it with n number of positrons. Now, this positron will split into two different kinds one that is free. So, let us call it n 1 which is free and n 2 which gets trapped trapped in defects 
where they will spend more time. Now, one that is the, the number n 1 which is free, it can either decay. If it is decaying, then you need to know the uh, rate constant and let us say it is lambda 1 which is equal to 1 over tau 1 or it can get trapped. So, even the free one they may initially be free, but at some point it may get trapped and therefore, it can get trapped with probability let us say nu. So, probability is the uh, of getting trapped is nu by concentration of vacancies C v. On the other hand n 2 it is trapped and it will have some other decay constant let us say lambda 2 which will be equal to uh, 1 by tau 2 and this lambda 2 will be smaller than lambda 1 because it is trapped. So, now we have a relation and so we can formulate it into an equation and the equation will look like this. So, d n 1 by d t is decaying only decreasing. So, there is a minus sign ahead of it with const rate constant lambda 1 times n, but there is also it is getting converted with a probability nu times concentration of vacancy C, uh, C v. So, this uh, this term gets added and over here we have n 1. On the other hand d and uh, the n 2 which is already trapped it is only decaying and therefore, there this has a minus lambda 2 sign lambda sign and it is uh, this is the rate constant and plus this quantity that you see over here is the trapped one is actually getting transferred or getting tr converted to this n 2 form. So, there is an increase in this number. So, we can say this is the increase which is equal to this. Now, once you have an equation like this it is very easy to show that the average lifetime of this positron annihilation can now be related with tau 1, tau 2 and C v and one can show that this will be something like this. So, what you see here is that the average lifetime keeps increasing with increasing concentration of C v and in fact, if you plot it it will look something like this. So, on the x axis I have concentration vacancies and on the y axis I have average lifetime and over here let me plot tau 1 which is the rate uh, which is the lifetime for the free vacancies sorry the free positrons and tau 2 which is the lifetime for the ones that are trapped and as you can see I have already shown tau 2 to be larger. So, if you had only free electrons sorry the free positrons meaning it does not get trapped it does it is only free and it goes from one end to the other end then it will have something like this. So, for some concentration which is very very low let us say almost close to 0 the average lifetime will be equal to tau 1. Now, as you keep increasing the concentration this will increase and there will come a time where most of them get trapped most of the most of the positrons get trapped and therefore, the max this will have lifetime equal to tau t tau 2. So, this is how this uh, plot would look like in general. Now, another interesting aspect is that when these positrons are generated they actually emit some gamma radiation. Now, when they are annihilated they ag then again they, uh, they generate a gamma radiation like the one I showed over here like according to that relation. So, both their birth and death are uh, correspond, uh, corresponds to some ra gamma radiation and this helps in detecting or the time when this event took place. So, you would you can easily characterize what was the time when this positron was generated and what was the time when it was annihilated and that way you know the time total time or the total lifetime of these positrons. So, so that makes the measurement of tau very easy and once you have this uh, tau then you can go back and find what should be the C v value and this is uh, another way to find the concentration of the vacancies. There are some more methods which are used for uh, 
measuring vacancies and uh, the main the most important problem with uh, most of this technique is that the concentration of vacancies are inside the bulk you cannot just measure on the surface because on the surface there will be uh, the surface is not the true representation of bulk so this has to be a characterization technique which measures bulk properties so some other techniques which are used are measuring properties measuring bulk properties for example resistivity will not go into de details i'm just listing out couple of these and uh, related to resistivity is conductivity the other one that we have already looked at is heat capacity and thermal expansion so some properties are measured which relate to the vacancy concentration the bulk properties which uh, which get, which depend on the concentration vacancy concentration so these are the only uh, methods there uh, there are not too many methods which are which can be used for vacancy characterization and uh, the last one that we discussed which was the positron annihilation spectroscopy the most important aspect of this method is that it is particularly useful for low concentration now most of the other methods are will work only when you have certain minimum number of concentration they will be able to measure the change however positron annihilation spectroscopy has the advantage that it is uh, useful particularly for low concentration of cv so now you have a wide gamut of uh, techniques uh, all limited in number which can measure from very low concentration to good number of concentration so with that uh, we will move on to another defect so we have so looked only at one particular point defect which was the simplest of this which was vacancy now let's move on to another point defect which is the another uh, which is another simplest point defect that you know it is self interstitial so what is a self interstitial as the name suggests that you have some pure element and this element one of the atom moves from its lattice site and goes into one of the interstitials not meant for uh, those atom positions so that is the interstitial so that is the kind of uh, defect which is called self interstitial and uh, i will schematically draw it so let's say we have so this will uh, be just a schematic so don't uh, as you can see that i'm drawing the the atoms that i'm drawing are not equal in shape which is not really the case so just take it as a schematic so now let's say one of these atoms moves to somewhere over here so there will be the stress field all around this the atoms over here will have to move to adjust this extra atom so this is this kind of defect is called self interstitial now this particular uh, kind of defect can be regarded as inverse of vacancies why what is vacancies vacancies is absence of atom from its place and what is interstitial it is an extra atom in that same number of lattice sites so that is why you can treat interstitials as inverse of vacancies however one must uh, note that when we are saying that you have to assume that the number of interstitial sites which i am representing by ni is equal to number of lattice sites only in that case we can directly use the relation that we have obtained for vacancies and therefore over here if we write delta g formation for interstitial it will become delta hf 
1 i just to represent that I am talking about 1 interstitial delta s formation i then x i or the e equilibrium concentration of interstitial would be given by exponential the, uh, the same relation except that the, the entropy formation and the enthalpy formation would represent that for interstitial self interstitial. So, this will become like this. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is a assumption over here when we are uh, doing it like this. What when this is not true? We will see in some other defects where as we go on we will talk about some other kind of defects for example, the Frankel and the Schottky defect and we will see what will happen when n i is not equal to n. But for this particular case uh, to begin with to understand the concept of self interstitial since we are regarding it as inverse of vacancies in this particular case we are assuming n i is equal to n which is number of interstitial sites is equal to the total number of lattice sites. So, now let us move on to, so this, this is was self interstitial, now let us move on to still another defect which is Frankel defect. Okay, so, let us let us first draw schematically. Now, Frankel defect is something that will mostly occur in uh, ionic substance. So, we will have uh, uh, let us assume a simple system where there is one cation and one anion the ratio is 1 is to 1. So, it will have something like this. So, they are alternating and as you can see that charge neutrality has to be maintained. So, in order to show that I will draw equal number of cations and equal number of anions. You can count that I have equal number of cations and equal number of anions. Now, what is a Frankel defect? Frankel defect is when cations which are the smaller of the two move to interstitial. Okay, so, here again we are talking about interstitials. So, how does that happen? Let us see something like this. Let us say this is a cation and it moves to interstitial and here um, I have shown it a little separated away unlike uh, the ones in the self interstitial just for clarity of the picture how the atoms are actually oriented will depend on which orientation you are looking at what is the crystal structure of that so all on all those aspects and here just for simple illustration i am taking as it as a square lattice in 2d plane and over here the atoms are separated apart so that this cation can move over here so now this cation moves from here so this becomes a vacancy and the cation comes over to this place so, this will be called a Frankel defect and why it is that can only cations move? It is because cations are usually the smaller in size, but there are of course, possibilities that anions can also move. Now, when, can I, when anions which are usually larger, but still in uh, cases they can move, when anions move to interstitial, then they are actually called anti Frankel defect. So, this becomes Frankel when the cations move and when the anions move they are called anti Frankel defect. Now, over here we will the formulation would be similar to the one that we have been using for vacancies and uh, that the one that we used for self interstitial. Now, however, if you look at the total number of configuration of the defects total number of configuration of defects this will be equal to total number of ways cation 
vacancy can be arranged. times total number of ways cation interstitials can be arranged. Okay. So, other things remaining same well, the only thing that will be different over here is how the entropy term is taken into account. Okay, so, the original equation would be something like this delta G equal to n f p which is the Frankel pair we are talking about one pair. So, uh, n number of pairs it is not just one vacancy it is one pair there will be one vacancy in the cation and one interstitial in the one cation in the interstitial. So, this will be formation Frankel pair minus T delta S formation which is for Frankel pair minus there will be the entropy term which is K T and since we are we have said that the entropy uh, the total number of ways that these defects can be distributed is the multiplication of the ways cation vacancy can be distributed times the ways cation interstitial can be distributed. Therefore, there will be multiplication factor of that w w uh, 2. So, it is as good as saying that w t is equal to w cation vacancies into w cation interstitials. And since this is in log we can take the uh, take a sum of the log instead of multiplying them instead in the bracket in uh, inside the log. So, it will look something like this n plus n v factorial by n factorial by n b factorial plus this is for the vacancy term and the other one will be for the interstitial term n plus n i and this n has to be actually number of interstitial sites. So, this will be what is n i here like I said earlier n i is the number of interstitial site. n is number of lattice site. Now, at this juncture we will have to make some assumption. What is that assumption that we may have to take? what is the relation between n i and n. For example, if we take a simple system n i will be equal to n. In other cases n i can not be equal to 1 may be it can be 2 n 3 n or uh, we can just let it be two different entities n i and n. So, in the next uh, lecture what we will do is we will see how it will be different when we have n i or the number of interstitial interstitial site equal to the lattice site and when number of interstitial site is not equal to. So, let me put it like this not equal to n it can be any other any other function of n. So, we will be derived for these two and in the meantime I will uh, suggest you try it on your own and then you would know how to derive this relation and we will do it in the next class. Thanks. Mm -hmm.